which is preferred because they have incidental fighting of pale discs or uh, abnormal fetal fields, or more recently, um, abnormal OCT findings. And this contrasts with other types of optic neuropathy like uh, NAION, optic neuritis, traumatic optic neuropathy, where there can be sudden visual loss uh, with, and without, with or without visual recovery or with and without pain. Uh, the medical history, medication history, family history, etc., are very important. In the medical history, you can ask about febrile illnesses as a child, which might suggest meningitis. Uh, medication history, particularly in Asia, about the use of evambutol in the past. Uh, family history, if they have a family history of um, unexplained visual loss, then you would think about hereditary optic neuropathies and any associated systemic symptoms, particularly risk factors for normal tension glaucoma. So, if we look at all the types of optic neuropathies, if we discount all those with acute visual loss, life is already much simpler because that it, what remains are hereditary optic neuropathy, compressive optic neuropathy, and also toxic and metabolic causes. <coughs> okay, in the examination, one of the most important things that we check on every patient is, of course, <coughs> visual acuity. Central vision is well preserved in glaucoma until the, the, the end stages. So this distinguishes it from most other types of non glaucomatous <coughs> optic neuropathy, like compressive optic neuropathy, optic neuritis, or even NAION. Color vision, as Claire <coughs> mentioned, most non glaucomatous optic neuropathies present with a red green color deficiency, whereas glaucoma. Uh, autosomal dominant optic atrophy and ethambutol related toxic neuropathy will present with <coughs> blue yellow color deficiency. But when was the last time you checked color vision on the glaucoma patients? So this is this is difficult. Okay, you would have thought the presence of an RAPD would help you to dis distinguish a unilateral uh, non glaucomous optic neuropathy from glaucoma. Unfortunately, studies have shown that in glaucoma, because of the asymmetric um, uh, presentation, 9 to 82% of them do have an ROPD, so that doesn't help you much. Intraocular pressure. So, my glaucoma specialist colleague tells me it adds no diagnostic value. It's merely a risk factor for glaucoma progression and allows you to monitor treatment response, but we need to be aware of ocular hypertension and thin corneas. Other signs, uh, you, we do, even as a neuro-ophthalmologist, need to do gonioscopy so that we can uh, rule out intermittent primary angle closure and look for signs of uveitis. Um, it, is, it has happened, not rarely in the past, that patients with a history of partial Slossman syndrome, um, they may, may have normal intraocular pressure at the time of seeing the ophthalmologist, but there are signs which is just suggested asymptomatic attacks in the past, which cause um, uh, glaucoma visual loss. Okay, so a quick quiz. How many of you think that this is normal? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, it is normal. Okay. <laughs> Next one. How many of you think that this is normal? Glaucoma or non-glaucomatous? Non-glaucomatous. Of course. Pale neuroretinal rim, no rim thinning. This is NAION. Okay, this one. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Abnormal. So glaucoma or not glaucoma? Glaucoma. Glaucoma. Because there's narrowing of the neuroretinal rim and the rim is pink. How about this one? Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. 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 Is it glaucoma or not? Um, nutrition. This is more difficult. This has um, increased compass ratio, but the rim is pale. To be honest, it's quite difficult to just distinguish from the other. So this is an uh, optic atrophy from L horn. So optic disc assessment is very important in distinguishing between glaucoma and non glaucoma is optic neuropathy. Normally, the disc is pink because of the presence of capillaries. And with retinal ganglion cell loss, you get this pallor. In non glaucomatous optic neuropathy, the key word is pale neuroretinal rim. In resolve uh, AION, you may get superior or inferior segmental disc pallor. And when you see bilateral segmental disc pallor or, or bow tie atrophy, then you need to think about chiasmal lesions uh, with uh, by 
right temporal uh, hemianopia. With glaucoma, you should get an increased cuptus ratio and the, the rim should remain pink. Usually, there's initial inferior temporal rim loss followed by superior uh, temporal sectors, therefore violating the ISID rule. However, at the end stage, the rim does appear pale. To make things up, uh, so, so other optic disc features uh, which are suggestive of glaucoma, including notching, uh, which is a focal loss of the RNFL. Nasalization, so if you look at these two pictures, normal versus glaucoma, you could say, see that the vessels um, are crowded more towards the nasal side. Uh, bayonetting of the vessels, where there is kinking uh, of the vessel as it enters the narrow retinal ret ret rim. Uh, the beta zone perigapillary atrophy, um, which is distinct from the alpha zone, which is a bit further away, but it can happen in normal patients. However, in high myopes, which is um, very common in, in Hong Kong, this is difficult to tell. So, optic disc hemorrhage is specific but non sensitive for glaucoma, and we need to be aware of the other causes of disc hemorrhage, including in the presence of optic disc swelling or diabetic retinopathy. But hopefully, there should be other signs which tells you this is not, uh, the disc hemorrhage is not caused by glaucoma. Unfortunately, optic disc cupping does occur in non glaucoma optic neuropathy as well. Not only after GCA, but also in NAION and other types of uh, non glaucoma optic neuropathy, and can also happen in physiological cupping. This gets tricky. So, the, even for the experts, so in the study um, where they invited 23 glaucoma and neuroophthalmology specialists to look at disc photos without any clinical information, they found that even experts made mistakes. So when they diagnosed glaucoma, 61%, only 61% were glaucoma, but 90% were dominant optic atrophy, 15% uh, LHON, and 5% were normal. So we're excused. <laughs> We, so, in addition to history and disappearance, we need something else. Visual field, of course, is very helpful. But looking at these two visual fields, they look exactly the same. One is from NAION and the other one is from glaucoma. So, once again, with visual field um, examination alone, it cannot give you the whole picture. So, in glaucoma, you get superior nasal, inferior nasal defects or arco defects. And at the end stage, uh, you can get tunnel vision. So this is mirrored in, uh, well, in optic neuritis in NAR where you can get something similar. But fortunately, with, in conditions without acute visual loss, like dominant optic atrophy and toxic metabolic uh, causes, you get a central or sequel central scotoma, which is quite different from what you get in glaucoma. Most important is if you get a visual field defect respecting the vertical meridian, you must think about chiasmal compression. OCT, I love OCT. In um, glaucoma, you can get inferior temporal and superior temporal retinal fiber layer defects. However, even OCT alone is not going to give you the answer. For example, if you look at this, this is the patient with NAION and this is with glaucoma. If we just look at the peripillary RNFL, the pattern deviation looks exactly the same as well as the average RNFL thickness. So finally, we get to neuroimaging. So when should we do it? We should do it when the patient has decreased central VA, when there's pale neuroretinal rim. If you have temporal visual field defects or if you have visual field defects which uh, are vertical aligned and respects the vertical meridian, when they have young age and normal IOP, and also when you monitor them, if they have a faster progression than you expect, then you should image them. Beware that in advanced glaucoma or optic atrophy, there's relative increase in CSF around the optic nerve, and therefore it gives you increased signal on T2 MRI images. And sometimes you get uh, reports from uh, radiologists saying that um, this patient has acute optic neuritis based on the finding of increased T2 signal and MRI changes. For example, in this patient, 56 year old patient with no glaucomatous optic neuropathy showed increased T2 signal reflecting optic atrophy, but he was referred to me for investigation of optic neuritis because of the MRI findings. 
okay, laboratory test, only to be performed selectively. Only after you've excluded the compressive optic neuropathies, you can think about doing serum B12 and thiamine, genetic testing, and also syphilis. I always do syphilis because it's totally treatable. So in conclusion, the most important aspect is, is uh, history. When there's sudden visual loss, central visual loss, or significant family history and medication history, you should think about non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. In the clinical examination, you should, you should pay particular attention to the central visual acuity, color vision, and dysmorphology. But we always have to complement it with perimetry and OCT. Neuroimaging, we should reserve um, for selected cases only. So thank you. I do have to acknowledge Professor Christopher Lerm, uh, our, my good colleague and 